Hey, I'm back for the third part of this presentation. Um, so as I said, in this part, I'll be talking about the non-arbitrariness of the sign. And this will actually uh, refer to two separate papers on the, on the same topic. So uh, this was joint work with Aria, Brian, Soren, Damian, and Brian. And uh, let's go into it. So the arbitrariness of the sign is an idea that go back uh, to a, a bit over a hundred years ago, well, when Saussure um, posted that the association between word forms and meanings is arbitrary. <clears throat> what this means is that uh, signifiers, for example, the word cachorro, in, in Portuguese are arbitrarily attached to the signified, which are the, the things they represent in the world. So um, what this means is that uh, choosing the word cachorro to refer to dogs in Portuguese is, is an arbitrary choice and any other word would work uh, in the same place. Um, but this is not the, the whole story. Uh, over the years, a lot of uh, researchers have talked about things like iconicity when word forms resemble the meanings they refer to. So words like meow, for example, will, will sound like the, the sound that the cat makes. Uh, systematicity of the sign uh, talks about how similar meanings are more likely to have similar forms. And this is kind of a statistical property of, of language and it's not a deterministic thing, but it's just like statistically speaking, more similar uh, meanings will have uh, more similar forms. And this uh, usually refers to the morpheme level, because if you think about morphological composition, uh, then this would be kind of obvious. But if you go to the morpheme level, it's it's a bit more more interesting. Uh, for example, the word for for dog and cat will be more similar because both are animals and and this kind of uh, off pattern. And uh, another um, another thing that escapes these arbitrariness of design are, are phonic themes, which are submorphemic units which are associated with some small semantic domain. And I'll explain a bit more about what they are later. Um, so I'll start with this uh, first paper, which was presented in ACL 2019, and it's called Meaning to Form, Measuring Systematicity as Information. So the research question uh, in this paper was, how could we quantify a language as systematicity of the sign? And there's a, a number of prior work trying to do this, and most of them what used the Pearson correlation between uh, the phonological distance and the semantic distance uh, of word pairs in a language. So you have some set of words in a language and you get the phonological distance between every pair in there and, be and the semantic distance between every pair. And then you get the correlation between both these metrics. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it, um, the researchers had to hand define the distance metrics they used. For example, using cosine uh, distance between word to vac representations for the semantic distance and uh, raw word form edit distance for the phonological one. Um, so that um, kind of, uh, the, that used a lot of assumptions from the part of the researchers to choose which, uh, how to define these distances. Um, the, the second problem is that since they were using Pearson correlation, after choosing a distance metric, only linear relationships between both metrics could be found and nonlinear relationships would not be captured. And the, the final issue was that it was very hard to control for other factors like part uh, of speech uh, using it. So for example, in Portuguese, uh, all verbs in the infinitive form will end in AR, ER, or IR. And if you're comparing uh, verbs and nouns all together and you take the Pearson correlation between the distances, you will find some kind of systematicity and just because of this very um, non-interesting systematicity that verbs look like verbs in Portuguese. Um, which uh, arguably is not as interesting as, uh, for example, two nouns 
being similar because of their the semantics they represent. So in our work, we define systematicity as a mutual information. So the mutual information between meanings and forms. And what this represents is it can be decomposed as the difference between two, these two entropies. So you have the overall uncertainty over forms and you subtract from it the uncertainty of the forms given that you know the meaning. And this represents how much uh, less uncertainty you have once you know the meaning. And this is how much information the meaning is giving you about the form. And why is this interesting? So uh, it uh, frees you from having to define distance metrics. Uh, this metric is kind of more holistic in the sense that it, it doesn't need to rely on, on, on sub representations, or uh, at least not distance ones. Um, it will capture nonlinear interactions between both random variables. And it's straightforward to control for other factors. Uh, you just need to use the conditional mutual information instead of the, the raw one. But uh, now the question is, how can we measure both the entropies we need to calculate it? So the strategy we use uh, to compute it is just uh, training uh, LSMs, uh, two LSMs to, to get that value. Uh, one LSM will be basically a phonotetic model predicting a phone given the previous ones in the same word. And it's a generative model of the word forms in a language, which will capture the uncertainty of it. And then we take the cross entropy of that LSTM on held out word forms and we get the cross entropy, which is an upper bound for the entropy. Uh, then we train another LSTM that we condition on, main, on meaning. And uh, to condition on meaning, what we do is we feed word to vac, uh, pre-trained word to vac representations as the initial hidden state of the LSTM and then predict the form condition on that. And that will give us this approximation of, of the second entropy. And then again, we, we take the cross entropy to approximate the entropy as an upper bound. Um, and then uh, by taking the difference between both cross entropies, we get an estimate for the mutual information that we want. We will also look at the uncertainty coefficient which is a bit more uh, interpretable than DMI by itself, because it will be a percentage from zero to 100%, representing how much of the original uncertainty was reduced by knowing the meaning. So if you have like uh, 3%, for example, or 5%, it means that 5% uh, of, of all the uncertainty was reduced by, by knowing the meaning. So uh, uh, for our results, we first uh, looked at CELEX, which we talked about in the previous parts. And um, we use only monomorphemic words because we were interested in morpheme level system at GST, uh, because that's what we, we thought was, was interesting. And what we found is that in all the three languages we analyzed with CELEX, we found statistically significant systematicity. And we also found that uh, the systematicity effect was significantly reduced once we con considered post tags uh, wh when we controlled for it. So, and th this shows the, the importance of uh, controlling for post tags when, when doing this kind of analysis. We then uh, looked at Narferolex, which you also talked about before. And while Narfer in Narferolex we don't have morpheme annotation, we uh, consider uh, it to control for it in some sense because of, of it being composed of these basic concepts. Um, as like as Narferolex has more than a hundred languages and some are endangered, it would be hard to train them one word to vac specific for each language. So we used uh, the English word to vac for all the languages here. Um, and uh, this might not be great, but that's what we, we could do with it. Um, and for our results here, we found significant systematicity effects in 87 of the 106 languages analyzed in this data set. When we controlled for the post tag, though, we only found uh, systematicity in 17 of them. Um, 
and uh, this is interesting and could be uh, caused by, by a number of things. Um, the, the first one is using English word to vec, for example, which could be uh, underestimating the, the amount of systematicity by having like non-representative meaning representations uh, for specific languages. Uh, another reason could be that uh, we have a lot less data here than in Celex per language. So our, especially our meaning, our meaning uh, conditions, uh, LSMs were a bit prone to overfit in this data set. So that might be uh, reducing our results. Um, but we conclude that uh, we can find systematicity in, in a, a number of languages in an unsupervised way, and that we, it's important to consider grammar, uh, grammatical classes uh, when doing this analysis to find more interesting forms of systematicity. Um, the last experiment in this uh, first paper was looking for fauna themes, which, as I said, are submorphemic affixal units. So they usually flag relatively small semantic domains. And the classic example in English is GL, which is related to light or vision, and it's present in, in a number of English words like glimmer, glisten, uh, gleam, or, or glow. And um, this, this fauna themes, uh, since they, they mark a small semantic domain, uh, our uh, hypothesis here was that they should have higher mutual information values when compared to other k grams. So if we got the mutual information between just like the prefix in the, in the word form or a suffix in the word form and the meaning um, that, that word form is conveying, we should find uh, higher mutual information values for phone esteems and for other, uh, for other prefixes slash suffixes. Uh, and you can check the paper to know exactly how we, we checked for, for significance there. But uh, as a result, we could find a list, a list of non phone esteems. Uh, in English, for example, all of the phone esteems we found, uh, this is just like a small, uh, set of them. I think we found like 10 or 15 for the sims. I don't remember. But all of them but two were attested in prior work. And we also found um, in German affixes, which were pieces of fossilized morphology. So since they were fossilized, they were not marked as morphemes by themselves in Salex. So we ended up finding them. Um, and um, from this experiment, we concluded that we could find uh, fauna themes in an unsupervised manner. Uh, we, uh, the only issue here is that we need a list of monomorphemic word forms or we would find um, non-interesting results. Um, in the second paper, looking at non returns of design, the, the paper was called Finding Concept-Specific Biases in Foreign Meaning Associations. and was just presented at NACO 2021. And in this one, we wanted to look at uh, non-arbitrariness cross-linguistically. So uh, the question here is if there are cross-linguistic associations between the forms and the meanings of the words. So as an example, the word for tongue uh, has been said to be more likely than chance to contain the phone L. And uh, you can see here in this plot, um, a number of words for tongue in, in languages that contain the phone L. Like this is a hand-picked languages, very biased map. Um, but for, for this analysis, what we did is we used uh, ASJP, which is a very cool data set, uh, composed of basic vocabulary word lists for almost three fourths of the world's languages. So over 5,000 languages. And for each of them, we would have up to a hundred basic uh, concepts translated into it. And these were things like body parts, color terms, or lower numerals, or, or other words that would be present in most of the world's languages. Uh, we used the same definition as before with the mutual information, and again, use an LSTM to compute its cross entropy uh, to approximate the entropies. But the issue here is that the cross entropy needs to be computed on data independent from training. 
and languages have been in contact. They are not IID. So we couldn't have uh, trained on a set of language, just train on a set of languages, test on another and hope it's held out because, because and the model didn't see those specific languages in training since the, the languages are, are in contact. So to maximize the independence, we split our data per, per macro area and we we had four macro areas in there americas africa eurasia and pacific and we used two for training one development and one test and we did cross validation across them to be able to test in all in all of them um, and this right to maximize the uh the independence between train and test sets we uh, since some of the language families cross macro areas, we grouped all languages from one family in a single macro area. Uh, the one with more of the languages, and we did that because we thought it was more important to control for genealogical uh, character uh, contact than aerial contact in our data set. Uh, since the list of concepts in ASJP was built as to be contain uh, concepts that are resistant to borrowing. So aerial effects should be weaker uh, on average than genealogical ones. Um, ASJP also has a notation for loan words. So we dropped those and we, we uh, used uh, another number of, of uh, tricks or, or techniques to, to try to maximize this independence, but that, that's in the paper. Uh, for our results, we found a very small contribution of meaning into form of approximately 0.3%. Um, and we note that it was uh, from 3 to 5% within languages. So uh, roughly 10 times uh, smaller the effect, but uh, we we already expected it to be to be small. It's not surprising, uh, but it's it's interesting. Uh, and so we conclude that there are very small but significant biases uh, on the way that word forms are, are built cross linguistically, and but we draw no stronger conclusions at this level of the analysis. Uh, we then looked per concept at the mutual informations we got. And out of the 100 concepts we analyzed, 26 of them had a significantly positive MI. So these were mostly uh, concepts like pronouns, colors, body parts, or environment terms, things like mountain, uh, rain, clouds, stars. And um, from this second experiment, we concluded that the effect seems to be driven mostly by a subset of the con concepts. It's not that all of, of the concepts are, are uh, it, it seems that not all of the concepts had uh, this strong four meaning associations or a strong, not that strong, but uh, this four meaning associations, but a few of them were driving most of the results. Um, in the paper, we also did a per language analysis, but I'll skip it here for the sake of time. And we also had a per concept token per analysis where we, we tried to find uh, specific phone names that were uh, statistically more predictable once you knew the meaning. So a significant, uh, meaning that they were strongly attached together, the meaning and the, and the phone name. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can find this also in, in the paper. And uh, this is it for the part uh, three of the, of the presentation. And I'll see you at the last part. Um, let me find out how to stop this. Thank